Well, hello and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Kevin. You're not. Oh, I wanted to see if it was like automatic for you yet, and you just say Peter without thinking. And I'm Peter. Uh, no, oh, well, it didn't work. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we're continuing our series on hermeneutics, and today we're going to talk about what the Bible is. Are, are we allowed to end with a verb at the end of that what sentence? What the Bible is. That's fun. What is, what is the Bible? And that sounds like an odd question for us to be asking on like episode 72 or, <laughs> or 70 or whatever this is. Fi finally into our podcast, we're saying, hey, what's the Bible? But this actually fits really well with our series on hermeneutics right now because as, as we're going through this series, we're going to talk about some things in scripture and some people might be saying, hey, well, my Bible says this or my Bible says it's that. And we might say, well, actually, that thing that you're referencing isn't actually the Bible. I know it's written in between the cover of the book that says the Holy Bible. It's, it's in the pages between those two covers, but that portion isn't actually the Bible. So we're going to talk about what is the Bible, what isn't the Bible, why this matters, how this is helpful to us, where you can go off the rails with it. We're even going to talk about a Facebook post in our group called The Croc Moot, where this actually ended up making a big difference for a few individuals when they discovered a certain phrase wasn't actually part of the Bible. So, Kevin, take it away. Well, as we... Should I, or should I say, not Peter, yeah. take it away. Well, yeah. as, as we continue our conversation of how to read the Bible, one of the questions that you encounter is, what am I supposed to read? And the answer for us is a little easier than for previous generations because most people have agreed on what the Bible is, and we have it published between two covers, as Peter said. And so you can go to the store and you can buy the Bible, the Holy Bible, or you could go download the Bible somewhere and you'll pretty much get the same thing wherever you go within a certain set of guidelines. Meaning you'll get 66 books that start with Genesis and end with Revelation in about the same order with about the same text, maybe some differences in translation, but pretty much basically the same Bible text and most people, when they say the Bible, especially in Western society, mean the 66 books that are in that collection that's, that we call the Holy Bible. Now, this podcast is not going to talk about how we got those 66 books or, or who chose them. or anything. We're not going to go into well, that. The, well, this episode. This episode, right. We, we might handle that at some point. Yes, but, but not, not, not this today. <laughs> what we're going to assume is that that's been done and now you have a book in your hands that contains those documents. But what we'd like to highlight is that not everything in that Bible, in that book that has the label Holy Bible is actually inspired text from God. Yeah. And I don't freak out. Don't leave. It's okay. Because this isn't <laughs> controversial. This is actually just noting some basic facts, okay? Now, let's be very clear. Let's review again. We believe that the words of the Bible are inspired by God and are inerrant, meaning they do not have any mistakes in them or errors, so that we believe every word of the Holy Bible as originally written at the, by the hand of the prophets and the apostles and evangelists are the holy and inerrant word of God given to us to make us wise into salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. So this episode is not questioning that. What we are helping but, you to see is that not every single thing that you have in your Bible are those words. There are what's editions. In, what's interesting is that, I don't know, affirmation or disclaimer, however we want to phrase what you just said, actually is necessary as we go into this episode because there are things that we're going to talk about that I think many of us, myself included, at some point in our lives assumed that's actually part of the inspired text. You can't 
you can't change that. Right. And if you change that, whatever that is, you're changing the Bible. And all we're pointing out is, no, there, there are some things that have been placed into that category wrongfully. Yeah, and or when you don't, and when you don't place them in that category, it's ac- it can actually be helpful to understand. Oh, that's that's actually not part of the inspired text, and it's helpful for my spiritual life and my Christology to actually recognize that, and and to also recognize that we're not accusing anybody of of wrongdoing or deceit. Yeah, that these things were added to the Bible on purpose in order to help us read the Bible. Yeah. And yeah. they are many times very beneficial for us to read the Bible. But as Peter just said, it's also helpful for us to know what things are not part of the inspired text and can sometimes end up influencing how we read this, the inspired text and not always in the correct way. So that's what we're going to look at this in this episode is what are the things that have been and added is such a strange word that have been intentionally included in your Bible, not in some kind of evil insidious way, but added in order to publish your Bible in order to make your Bible more usable in order to make your Bible, um, something that you can read and I can read at the same time and we'll know where we are in our Bibles together Mm -hmm. and how to find other passages together. There are things that help you, understand how to read the Bible in context. There are things that help you know how to read the Bible um, in a lectionary series where we have um, certain sections of the Bible marked off. There are things in the Bible that help you know where the Old Testament is being referenced in the New Testament. There are things in the Bible that will help you um, maybe know where in the world the Bible is referring to certain geographic features. There are things in the Bible that may help you understand how people in the Bible weighed and measured things and what that <laughs> means for us when when Noah uses a cubit to build the ark. I think ark. that the, fa- the favorite joke is everybody turn to the book of maps. Right, exactly. It's in the back. It's in the back. Or the, like, book of, the book of weights and measures, right? The book, <laughs> the so, book of concordance. Yes. Wait, what? And again, and another thing, a concordance is something that is added to the Bible in order to help us read the Bible, because that's a list of words that are used and how and where they are used. Okay. All right. So so what, what, what do you have a list, Kevin, that we're going to work through here in a particular order, or should I just start throwing things out there? I think the first important thing to do is everybody open your Bible to any place in the Bible you want. Okay. So open, I'm open to Matthew seven. Well, okay. Let's go to Matthew seven. Then Peter's going to dictate that we go to Matthew chapter seven. I'm just so, telling you where I'm open. I didn't dictate anything. So as we turn to Matthew 7. If I did dictate it, it was benevolently it so. Was benevolently dictated. <laughs> so as we turn to Matthew 7, what you'll notice is that there are things on these pages that you are turning that are not part of the biblical text, such as page numbers. Right? Mine are at the top of the page. I have page numbers. Yours might be at the bottom of the page. Mine are at the bottom in the middle. Yours might be in the bottom middle. Those are not part of the Bible. The fact that Matthew 7 on my Bible is in 1592. Mine's in 1245. Those are not inspired numbers. Okay, now that's easy. <laughs> nobody, nobody that I know thinks the page numbers in your Bible are inspired. But this is what we're talking about. There are a lot of things on the page of the Bible that are not inspired texts, but are simply there to help you find where you are or help you read it. Now, the whole idea that you said, Matthew chapter seven, verse one, none of those things are inspired. The name of the book, Matthew, not inspired. The, The number of the chapter, seven, not inspired. The verse numbers, not inspired. Now I get the the verse and chapter number. I I know that one. I mean I, I get I get that. Um, I also thought that I have heard that during Martin Luther's time, so 1500s, verse numbers weren't a thing. They they more, more dealt in chapters. Is that true? When did verse numbers become 
added to the text, if I can phrase it that way. So the verse numbers were added, I, I think it's 1555 is when they started being added in a, in a normal way. Um, okay. But it's it's after Luther's time. Normal being standardized? Standard, and like they become they standardized. always the same way? So, okay. so one of the things that happens is the publication of Bibles, um, as the printing press becomes popular, and then as the, the translations become standardized, you think of the great translations like William Tyndale's translation, which leads to the King James Version in 1611. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is one of the great moments of standardization and the publishing of the Bible, which, which means from that point forward, there are a lot of things in the Bible that can't be changed because 1611 King James Version established them as the way it is. Hmm. So you pretty much have standardized verse numbers after that. Now, I'm not saying they weren't before that, but that's kind of the end of the, if there's any possible changes, they're done after King James. <laughs> now is the time to do it. As yeah. a matter of fact, that Bible is so influential that we now have verses that appear to be, quote, missing because they were in the King James but are not in some current English translations. And we'll get that there. Yeah, that's not why. this episode either. That's not this I episode either. But that's because that's a big topic. I will simply have this <laughs> disclaimer: they're not missing; they were actually non-accurate inclusions in the King James version that we have now correctly looked at manuscript and realized that they were not actually supposed to be in the the place where the King James put them originally. So they're not removed by the English versions; they're actually unfortunate additions in the King James. Yeah. But what my point is, the verse numbers were so solidified at that moment that now when we translate the text according to the Greek manuscripts and those words are not there, we continue the versification. So we'll have <laughs> skipped verses and people say, oh, my, my Bible's missing, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. John, right. John 7, 53 through 8 verse 11 is gone. So my, my Bible goes from 752, John 752 to 812. And you say, well, why? You say, well, because that text was in the King James and so got verse numbers and chapter numbers, but isn't actually in the most reliable Greek manuscript. So now we don't put it in there. It appears to be, quote, missing or taken out. It's not. So this yeah. is actually the point, is that the chapter numbers and the verse numbers were added by people not through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, just to help us identify what, where we're talking about in the Bible so we can say, turn to Matthew 7, verse 1, and we all go to the same place. Without the right. chapters and the verses, I would have to say, turn in the first book of the Greek portion of your Bible to the place where it says, right? And I have to quote the text, and I hope you can find it. And, and hope that we know our scriptures well enough to actually know where that is, too. Right. It's, it makes it even harder for somebody who doesn't know the Bible at all right. to be able to find anything. So then, yeah. you notice I skipped a lot of things, like the words New Testament. That's a <laughs> word that was not inspired. As a matter of fact, it was first used around 200 AD to describe New Testament and Old Testament. Those were words that were later added that has become, if you look at the table of contents of your Bible, it probably says Old Testament and New Testament. Well, those terms even weren't inspired. Now they are they are from scripture. They're found in scripture. It's found in the book of Hebrews and a place like that in Jeremiah right. thirty one, those kind of things. But but as a as a as a physical delineation of the books of the Bible, that's not an inspired thing. That's something we've added. So again, nothing insidious, nothing evil, but it does help you realize that the title of the book, Matthew, not inspired. Well, chapter let, let seven, me put it. the chapter number seven, not inspired. The chap the verse number one, not inspired. Well, let, let me put it this way. At this point in time, with the things that we've mentioned, we wouldn't want to change it. Right. It, would, it would actually end up being harder. Or, so the verse numbers aren't inspired. Okay, we're not saying, therefore, let's get rid of them. That, no. That'd be kind of silly because it actually is very helpful. Like I said, somebody who doesn't know their Bible at all, this is extremely helpful in helping them get to where you want them to be to read and, and understanding it. There's, there'd be no reason to, from here on out, we need to publish all Bibles without verse numbers. That, that'd be silly. That'd be, that'd be uh, not helpful. 
And, yeah, and not even, helpful. <laughs> even think about worship. So you go to church and you say, the gospel reading today is from Matthew 7, verses 1 through 10, right? Yeah. Well, that helps because now I can go home. I can look it up in my own Bible. I can do devotions with my family based on the text from, from Sunday. And I'm not flipping around going, does anybody remember where that, how that goes, right? You, <laughs> you can take it home. It's easy. You can write it down. You can put it in your phone. You can look it up online, whatever, right? And that's, that's the point of all this. It makes the Bible easily read. You can, you can open to the, the portion you want to read and read it. So that's the positive part of all this, of verses and chapters and the names of the book. Now, now let me review a little bit. The names of the books are not inspired. I'm, I'm not trying to freak you out. It's okay. Matthew did write Matthew, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, I was just going to say, and that he did write it. That comes from all the early manuscripts of the Gospels, okay? There aren't manuscripts that say, actually, you know, George wrote Matthew. You know, it's not like that. They, they all George say was according an idiot. to it was Matthew. Bob. It was Bob, right. <laughs> they all Bob. say according Everybody to knows Matthew. That. So all the manuscripts have according to Matthew. But we, but nowhere in the inspired text of the Gospels do they identify their authors. Okay? Nowhere does John say, I'm John and I'm writing this. Nowhere does Matthew say, I'm Matthew and I'm writing this. Now, Paul's letters, he does say, Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus to the church in Corinth or something like that. Peter right? identifies him and Peter identifies himself in his himself. letters too. Yeah. Okay. John does not in any of his writings, except for in revelation where he says, I, John, and I'll have Patmos, but, but his other four writings, he doesn't. Okay. But so my point is that the titles of the book, even the places where they identify themselves, though, that's the title of the book was put on there by somebody to identify what book we're talking about. And, and this is actually easily understood and seen when you look at the way the early church quoted the Bible is they didn't use the names of the books. They just said, you know, as it says, and then they quote scripture. And we would, we kind of have to go look that up and then add the names of the book to it. Because yeah, we just Jesus, added, yeah. Jesus does the same thing. Right. He'll, he'll quote Isaiah, but he doesn't necessarily say, according to Isaiah in this chapter and in this verse, right. he just says, the it was said. Yeah, or it this, was said. the prophet said. Oh, you've heard Here it you said. Go. Yeah. <laughs> or according to Moses. And then he quotes somewhere in Moses, right? Some of the yeah. five books. So so the names of the books, not necessarily inspired. Chapter numbers, not inspired. The verses, not inspired. Now, the reason that's important is some people feel so bound by chapters and verse that they think if you don't quote the entire verse, you're leaving something out. Or they think that you can't put two sentences together because there's a chapter break between them. And this can actually shape the way that we interpret biblical texts is sometimes because of the verse numbers and chapter numbers, we will read the text as they are as being more disconnected than they actually are. Okay. And, yeah. And this happens a lot where people will, will, um, be reading along in the Bible, and because the little number that that delineates the beginning or ends of verses, you know, they will actually end up reading sentences together as though they belong together or don't belong together because of where the verse goes, or because of the chapter breaks, or and this brings up the next thing: a lot of chapters, or a lot of a lot of Bibles, not all of them, but some of the Bibles actually include subtitles. Okay, so you'll have little subtitles in your biblical text. So like on in my Bible, in Matthew 7, 1, it says as a subtitle above the text in bold letters, it says judging others. Mine says concerning judging others. Okay, so those are subtitles that were not inspired and are not part of the biblical text. They were added by the editors of, of the English edition that you are reading. So the ESV editors who put the Bible together, they didn't, editors meaning they took the translated text and, and let, put it on a page and checked for spelling errors and those kind of things. When they laid it out, they added subtitles to help you read through the text. Now, again, we're not saying that these are insidious or evil or wrong. What we're saying is they are not part of the inspired inerrant word of God. So when you are reading the Bible, sometimes those subtitles 
will force you into an interpretation that may or may not be consistent with what the text is actually saying. You're actually reading someone else's interpretation of the scriptures. And sometimes those subtitles will actually interrupt a thought of the yeah. text and therefore make you read the, the text as little sections instead of a long narrative or a long thought section. Or, or it'll break up a section where it shouldn't necessarily be broken up. Right. Or where it's not helpful for it to be broken up. So I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to take our example from Matthew 7 that Jeremy posted in the Grok Moot. Uh, for him, this this was a big deal, and I'd, I I think he'll be fine with us sharing this this example. Uh, he he is a listener. He can yell at us if he wants to. Um, he won't. He'll have no, he's, he won't. He'll, he's anyways, so he, he I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but he was looking at Matthew 7, particularly verses 11 and then into 12. Um, and Kevin, in the ESV, do you have a, a division between 11, verse 11 and 12 in Matthew 7? I have a subheading above verse 12 that says, the golden rule. Okay, I don't, which is very interesting. Um, I have the NASB, the New American Standard Bible here in front of me that I'm using today. I don't have a subheading between 11 and 12. So I'm going to read verses 11 and 12 um, in the ESV as it's posted here in the Grokmoot in the question. Um, and then we'll discuss it. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven good, give good things to those who ask him? And now, the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, and, and 13 continues on. That's how the ESV breaks it up. I'm going to read the NASB without that break. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, it's a minor, seemingly, editorial choice in the ESV to add that subhead, the golden rule, right before verse 12. But in some people's reading of it, when all they've read is the ESV, when that's the primary scripture they use, that actually has made a difference in how they understand those two passages, those two verses, and whether or not they are related to each other. Right, Kevin? Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> um, and in this case, it's it's a, well, they're two separate thoughts. You know, one, the therefore, yeah, that's referring to everything. You know, the therefore at the beginning of 12 is referring to everything previously, but it's actually a very specific reference. 12 isn't a separate thought that begins a new discourse. It's actually more of a concluding thought to the previous about how to love people and how to pray. Mm -hmm. I guess, actually, it's about prayer. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. So if you guys haven't joined the Grok Moot, go check that out and just see the discussion there that, that Jeremy started. It's, it's really a good discussion that fits really well into what we're talking about. Kevin, my text has something else here. All the letters are in red. Okay, during good. During this passage. So another editorial choice is what's called, in not every Bible, but in some Bibles, it's called the red letter edition. And some people thought it would be beneficial to identify when Jesus is speaking. So direct quotes from Jesus, not indirect quotes, but direct quotes from Jesus, they put in red. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, that is often very beneficial because it makes it very easy to open your Bible quickly and kind of see where Jesus is speaking and see where the narrator is speaking or someone else, right? However, right. the Greek text does not have quotation marks. There are not quotation marks in Greek. So we are not always certain when Jesus is speaking and when the narrator is speaking. And probably the most classic example of this, or the most obvious example, is John chapter 3, where you aren't certain at all when Jesus is... We know Jesus is speaking, but we're not sure where his speech ends and the narr narrator starts narrating. Let's, let's go to that. And Kevin, if you could read that for us, because John 3 is kind of a seminal 
foundational passage that almost every Christian learns at some point, especially John 3.16. And so if we're going to say something that questions, I'm doing air quotes on a podcast. Right. I've, I've also been nodding as you're talking this whole time. Nobody can see me nodding. Mm-hmm. But you know, if we're going to mess with John 3, um, well, we got to be really careful. Because that's, that's what happens when you say something like this about a passage that everybody knows. It's like, <gasps> this is why you had that disclaimer way back right. at the beginning. Kevin's messing with the Bible. You can't do that. <laughs> right. We're actually, we're, we really aren't. As a matter of fact, what we're really doing is we're talking about um, we're we're making sure that we're very clear on what the biblical text actually is and what things people have done to help us read the text, which yeah. which are usually beneficial, but sometimes can cause people to read these editorial things as actually inspired aspects of the text when they really aren't, and yeah. therefore it can color. <laughs> Red letter to color, <laughs> color our I, reading. I got Thank it. Thank you very much. Um, sometimes they can color our reading unintentionally, and and there are a lot of most of the things that we're looking at are are overall beneficial. But yeah, but it does help to read, um, understanding what's going on, and and I'll make some ju- suggestions at the end of how to how to read. Sometimes trying to avoid some of these things, um, just to give you a different way to read the scriptures because it's kind of fun to read it in different ways sometimes. So if we look at John three, go to verse nine, it's very obvious that we're having a conversation and that Jesus is actually being quoted in the first person. Okay. As, as in first person speech, this is a direct quote from him. So in verse nine, Nicodemus, who is the guy Jesus is talking to, right? Nicodemus said to him, that means to Jesus, how can these things be? Obviously that's a question. Um, Mm -hmm. The Greek, there does tell us that it's probably a direct quote. And then Jesus answered him. And then we would expect a direct quote from Jesus because that formula says he's gonna, we're going to quote Jesus. Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. So obviously Jesus is addressing Nicodemus as you. This makes sense to be a direct quote, right? And then he says, truly, truly, I say to you. So obviously Grammatically speaking, the first person there would mean that we're still quote, we're quoting Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. We speak of what we know, so still first person, and bear witness to what we have seen. But you, again, referring to Nicodemus and maybe others with him, because you know could be plural there, not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things, right? So okay. obviously yeah. we have first person, second person. That's pretty obviously a quote. That's pretty obviously Jesus speaking. So it's in red. Now listen to this. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. Well, now we flip to third person. It's not first person, second person. Now it's third person because we have he. Ah. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now we're in second person. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay? So this is the issue is now we've switched to third person from first and second person, but there's no grammatical reason other than the change of persons to switch speakers. And and this isn't, so we got two things going on. We've got quotes, quotation marks, and we've got red letters, depending on which edition right. you're going with. So there so, are two, two things that do not appear in the Greek manuscript, quotation marks and red letters. Which are really probably the same decision. If you're going to put quotation marks in a red letter edition, you're basically saying Jesus said this. Right. Okay? Yeah. But if you don't have a red letter edition, you still will have the question of where do you start and end the quote of Jesus? Okay. So the question is, does Jesus actually say to Nicodemus, John 3.16? Or is this the author of the gospel explaining Jesus' conversation to Nicodemus to the reader? Theologically, what what difference does it make? Because I could be, I frankly, I'd be more freaked out if you said Jesus didn't actually say this because my entire life I've been told Jesus said this. And so hearing that he might not have said it, that it's John explaining it, 
Well, that that's where the freaking out kind of starts happening. So <laughs> the theological import of this is not overly important at this in this text because whether Jesus said it or John said it, it's equally true. Remember, at the end of the Gospel of John, he tells us that the things that he wrote are written in order that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name. So these words that John wrote are actually the efficacious words, meaning effective words of God that will give eternal life to those who believe. So whether this and is... And we believe that what, one way or other, they're inspired. Right, they are inspired. So we're not saying they're not inspired. Yeah. All we're saying is what isn't inspired is the notation of where the quotation of Jesus actually ends. Whether he says all of this or whether his quote goes to the end of verse 21 or whether his quote ends at the end of um, 12, 12 or whether his quote ends at the end of 15. Those are all places where people have suggested the end, that Jesus's quote ends. Um, and again, what's the import? We'd have to talk about the gospel of John and how he uses faithful testimony and Jesus's own words and, and those kind of things. I can simply tell you as a John scholar, it doesn't actually make theologically that much difference. It makes a little bit of difference from a narrative point of view, as far as how the, the gospel itself is constructed, but it doesn't make a lot of theological difference because either way, the theology of the verse is true. It's teaching us, it's the inspired word of God teaching us the truth about Jesus. But if I were to speak up in Bible study when my pastor is teaching, I say, yeah, pastor, Jesus didn't actually say that. You're going to get a lot of <laughs> well upset it, people. Or, or you're getting a lot of people saying, why do you think he did? Like, what did, where are you getting that from? Well, my Bible has it in red. And that's exactly the point is that we're yeah. trying to equip people to say, yes, the Bible that I'm looking at, the editor chose to put these words in red. That might be accurate, but it isn't necessarily an inspired part of the text, that the redness of the words. The words themselves are inspired, but the fact that they're red or black is not. It's a choice of the translator or the editor. Okay. Yep. Just like yep. the subtitles, just like the verse numbers, just like the chapter numbers, just like the page numbers, they're there to help you, but they are not the inspired word of God. So, so if you really cut to the chase, here's what we're saying. And it's, it's this simple. We do not derive doctrine, official teaching from the versification, from the chapter marks, from the fact that your Bible has red or black letters in it, or from the page numbers, or from the titles of the books. We don't derive doctrine from those things because they are not part of the inspired word of God. We also do not derive doctrine from the study notes that you might find in your Bible. Wait, you skipped one. Punctuation. Punctuation is another that's, issue. That's a big one. Let's let's well, let, before we go to study notes. Can you quick mention that because there's no punctuation well, or capitalization in the Greek either. There's no explicit punctuation or capitalization in either the Hebrew or the Greek original manuscripts. So e there's th by the way, there's no spacing between letters or words either. All the letters <laughs> run together. They're written without spaces between words. So if you thought reading English was hard, one of the first things you have a, to learn an original Greek manuscripts, <laughs> right? One of the things you learn when you read Greek manuscripts is you have to actually figure out where the breaks of words are. And this includes when they go over lines, right? Now there's no, there's no, they don't hyphenate words either. So when it break a line, when a line ends, they just start over the next line in the middle of a word. And it's all written in capital letters. The earliest manuscripts all written in capital letters. So there's no difference between, you know, the beginning of the sentence and the end of the sentence, and it just it just runs together. There's no paragraph marks. There are now you can tell where a book ends because they will start over on a new line, or actually put the name of the next book. But otherwise, within the books, you're just kind of running text, and so part of the manuscript reading is to actually decide where words break, which is not that hard. It's not as hard as it sounds. You can pretty much figure it out most of the time once you get used to doing it. But there are occasions when we're not totally sure. And there mm -hmm. are occasions in which the punctuation is up for debate, meaning the grammatical construction could have a word 
that is tied to the previous sentence as the end of that sentence, or it could begin the next sentence. So some yep. of the punctuation is discussed in scholarship about where it belongs. Most of the punctuation that you'll see in your English Bibles is pretty well agreed upon by every uh, scholar, translator. It's pretty standard, but there are occasions when uh, there are some punctuation issues that are up for discussion. Or, and, and usually it happens this way, is more um, which words belong with which phrase. So... Yeah, and we can we can get we can get to all that. There, <laughs> well, there's let's one not go too one. deep on this one today. Deep. But yeah, all we're all we're really looking at is just trying to help you understand that when you look at the biblical text, the inspired words are are a, a portion of what you will see on the page. It's not the number, the big numbers. It's not the little numbers. It's not the subheads. It's not the study notes. It's not the cross references. It's not the fact that some words are red and some reds are some words are black. It's not even the page numbers. None of those things are part of the original inspired text of the Bible. They are all additions to help us read the Bible better and easier. Our our concern or our reason for mentioning this, in, especially in a series on hermeneutics, is to help you ensure that your hermeneutic how you are reading and understanding scripture isn't based on those things, right? but is instead based on the three principles that we mentioned in the last couple episodes, the, the crystal, Christological principle, the coherence, the integrity, teaching you how to read scripture that way, because while these things are helpful, uh, and for, in the vast majority they're helpful, I, well actually if we talk about study notes, um, depending on what study notes you have so you have a Schofield Bible your study not notes helpful. are going to be supremely unhelpful yeah don't read the study notes. if you have a Schofield study Bible please do not read the notes and, and we can explain um, what's why the, what's, the, what's the modern version of that it's not Schofield anymore well they do have Schofield, Schofield still, still out around. there but, but there's there's a newer version my wife actually used to have it I used to have it even but the, the point being the study notes are actually a very explicit hermeneutic in that they say, we want you to understand the text in this way. Right. So when you're picking a study Bible, it's actually really, really important that you pick one that follows the her- the hermeneutic. Well, we'll just be honest, the hermeneutic that we're teaching you uh, because it's centered on Christ. Because all other study notes, if they have a different hermeneutic, they're actually training you to read the Bible the way they want you to. And, and it's it's different. So this Kevin, is you keep breathing like you want to say something. You're well, like, this I is have some. this is something that I actually I encountered in my my life as I learned hermeneutics was that I actually had a Schofield study Bible, not on purpose. It just happened as the first Bible that I read on a regular Ryrie, basis. The Ryrie the, study Bible. Ryrie. That's the yeah. common one. Yeah, yeah that's the one, that's that the one I was of, thinking of. It didn't totally replace it. It kind of. It moved, continued it the same it theology. It moved it forward. It updated the theology, yeah. moved it forward. Yeah, yeah okay, right. continue. So I actually had a Schofield study Bible, and I remember sitting in a Bible study, a Lutheran Bible study, and hearing something and looking at my Bible and saying, you're contradicting the Bible. But what I was actually looking at was a Schofield study notes. And this is ah. part of the reason we're doing this is because the study notes are not the inspired text. Even the notes in the Lutheran study Bible as good as they may be, are not inspired text. They are interpretations of the inspired text. So when you are reading your devotions, make sure that you understand what you're reading to be inspired word of God and what things are there to help you along through the word of God, but are not necessarily inspired themselves. So when your pastor is teaching and he says something and then you look down at your study notes, and you say, Oh, but my study note says <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome to ask him. Please yeah. ask him. It's actually a good question to ask. Why right. do my study notes say this? Right. My Bible That's says actually a good question. that the, the, you know, the red sea wasn't actually turned to blood. It was just red algae or something. And you raise your oh, hand and you the say, red tide. why Why would it say that? And and your pastor will be able to explain that. He'll be able to say, yes, 
That's right. Some people take this verse this way, and this is why they do that. And then he will explain hermeneutics. He will, <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's yeah. actually what you're asking. He, he is, might not use that word, but that's what he'll be doing. Yeah, he'll actually be explaining the, the method that people use of reading that will draw that conclusion out. And you'll say, well, then why are you interpreting it this way? And he will explain to you, well, because of how we're reading scripture, Christological, right? With the integrity principle and coherence principle and centered on justification by grace through faith with the means of grace, we read this text this way and he will explain. And you are welcome to ask him that. You are welcome to say, why are you teaching me the text this way? That's exactly now, we're, what we're getting at. We're cu- we're coming up at the end at the end of this episode, but there are two things I want to mention that I did when when I, I but uh, matured probably isn't the the right word, but in in my spiritual walk, trying to learn to understand scripture and recognizing that the Bible that I had at the time, the study notes definitely had their own perspective. They had a hermeneutic that they were pushing. I didn't necessarily know the word hermeneutic back then whenever this was, but I I knew they have a particular viewpoint that they're trying to impress upon me. I want to be able to read the Bible for myself and just to understand it on my own. So there are two things that I did. One is I actually got the Bible that I currently have in front of me, which was a Thompson Chain Reference Bible. And the reason I got that is because in the in the margins of of this Bible all the way throughout, it has keywords and each verse basically has a word attached to it that says this this verse is about this subject and then it has a number a chain reference so you can go look up all the verses that also deal with that same subject and i thought well this is great it's an impartial you know trying to be objective all it is is telling me the subject that that verse is talking about and then here's a list of all the verses well eventually i learned wait a minute not all those verses are necessarily about that topic. This is what somebody thinks those verses are about. The editor, I don't know if Thompson is his name, this was his way of studying the Bible. And while it might still be helpful to a certain extent, I'm still not reading just the Bible and and understanding just scripture. So the next thing was, hey, there's this Greek Hebrew keyword study Bible where now it's the Greek and the Hebrew words, and I can actually go and study it from there. Well, I ended up running into the exact same problem there because I can't read Greek and Hebrew for myself, so I'm at the mercy of the editor who put this together, who tells me this is what the Greek and Hebrew is and and all of that. And so even in my attempts to avoid somebody else's hermeneutic by going with these more objective Uh, measures, I wasn't actually able to avoid it at all. What I needed to learn and what why we're doing this now was to actually learn the right hermeneutic so I could actually recognize it for myself. I actually needed to have a hermeneutic. Mm -hmm. I couldn't just avoid it and say, oh, I can understand God's word on my own. I need just find the way to do it on my own without any preconceived notions, blank slate, all that kind of stuff. I actually needed to learn the right hermeneutic and that's that's what we're doing right now and and i hope it's also clear that what we're doing is we're trying to encourage everyone to focus on the actual words of scripture yeah we're not trying to say pay attention to us or pay attention to our interpretation of it first we're saying we're really helping you cut through all of it and say look at the actual inspired words from god because that's those are the words that we base everything on. Those are the words, not the subheads, not the verse numbers, not the chapter numbers, not the page numbers, not the study notes, not the cross references, not the concordance, not the tables of weights and measures in the back, not the maps. No, when we talk about doctrine, we talk about faith and, and what Christ has done for us and who God is in Christ Jesus. We want to get to the very words of God because those are the very words of life. And that is the crucial conversation. Thank you guys for joining us this week. We'll be continuing our series on hermeneutics. There's so much that we're going to be covering on this. Uh, we're, we're we're four episodes in or five episodes in, and it's like, 
oh, we've barely scratched the surface. <laughs> and I'm really excited about where we're going to be going and some of the stuff that's that's come up in our discussions on the side as we're talking about what we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, especially because, th- in, in a sense, everything is is hermeneutics. I mean, this yeah. is this is critical. This is important. And we're excited to be doing this. If you're also excited that we're doing this, if you like what we're doing with Crucial Productions and Crucial Conversations and want to support that, head to crucialproductions.org slash give. You can donate there. You can sign up for our email list. You'll get a pop-up on our website. I haven't sent out any email updates recently, but I should at least send one out telling our people that we started a series on hermeneutics. That'd be a good thing to let our email people know about. Um, you got a question as we're going through this series. We have been receiving questions. We haven't gotten to them yet, but I promise we will. We had a question come in about N.T. Wright. Um, that guy's a genius. And then it's like, wait, why'd you say that? So mm-hmm. Kevin has fun talking about him. We've <laughs> had some good conversations about N.T. Wright. So we'll, we'll, we'll address that at some point and, and whatnot. You got, a, you got questions. Send them to questions at crucialproductions.org or go to the website, crucialproductions.org, and at the top it says ask a question. Click on that, fill out the form. Any final thoughts, Kevin? Nope. Anything else? Nope. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. We'll see you guys next time. See ya. <laughs>